Good morning. I am Dr. Pamudita. Today uh, we'll be having a lesson on pediatric nursing. Uh, namely, the topic that we are going to be studying today is the newborn examination. Okay, so a newborn examination is conducted by a nurse when uh, when we are dealing with a newborn child. Uh, it is an examination where we determine to see if the child is healthy or not, the newborn child is healthy or not. So it is very important for us to have a thorough uh, knowledge about the newborn examination or the newborn assessment. Okay, so moving on, the learning objectives for today's topic will be how to classify a newborn, understanding what the APGA score means, assess growth measurements, assess vital signs, estimate the gestational age, how to assess the different body systems, recognize normal findings in the newborn examination, and recognize common newborn problems. Okay? Right. Moving on. So, a newborn is, is, a, uh, is a child that was uh, born readily. So, before a newborn is, before a child is born, we classify the child's age via gestational weeks okay that we call that the period of gestation so we have classified it as preterm term and post term preterm uh preterm a preterm child or a preterm baby is a baby that is born in less than 37 weeks of gestation a full term child is born from 37 weeks to 40 weeks okay that's a term baby a post-term baby is a baby who is born after 42 weeks of gestation. We can also classify a newborn through, uh, from their birth weight. And uh, namely, we divide it into low birth weight, very low birth weight, and extremely low birth weight. Okay? So, low birth weight. So, as you all know, uh, a normal birth weight child is, 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 from two, two, is more than 2,500 uh, grams. Uh, so, a low birth weight child comes as less than 2,500 grams. A very low birth weight child comes as less than 1,500 grams. And an extremely low birth weight child will be less than 1,000 grams or 1 kilogram. Okay? We can also divide it via, via uh, weight percentiles where we plot this on a graph and see which percentile this child belongs to. So, for if, if the child is uh, within the 10th to 90th percentile, we call it average gestational age. Uh, if the child is less than, uh, is, yeah, if the child is less than the 10th percentile, we call it small for gestational age. If the child is more than the 10th percentile, we call it large for gestational age. So as you can see, this is the, this is where how we, uh, may uh, plot on the gestational age chart okay seen in these slides uh, we can see the uh, child uh, the, the children who the difference between the child who is 1.8 kilograms 4.4 kilograms and 3.65 kilograms now a small for gestational age happens uh, when there is uh, something wrong in, in the mother uh, when the child was in the mother, it could be either due to a, uh, uh, either due to a nutritional def deficit while the baby was in the mother. It could be due to low blood uh, blood supply from the mat low maternal blood supply. So there are many causes. So when the child is having a reduced blood supply, let's say if it's a reduced blood supply and the child is not developing inside and growing, the the growth is tends to be normally symmetrical. A normal child's growth will be symmetrical. So uh, sometimes, even though a child is small for gestational age, he will be symmetrically uh, small. So the child's head might be the same size as the rest of the body. So it, it, in proportionate to the rest of the body. So symmetrical happens in 33% of all small for gestational age infants. The head circumference, length, weight, all are less than the 10th percentile. And common causes are infections, chromosomal abnormalities, inborn errors of metabolism, smoking, and drugs. Asymmetric uh, small gestational age occurs when the 
child's uh, weight is less than 10th percentile and the head circumference and the length of the child is normal. This is seen in 55% of small for gestational age babies. This is normally the main reason for why this happens is because uh, the child when in the mother's stomach has a uh, priority for the child's head. The blood supply is the priority is always sent to the child's brain for the brain development. So if there is a reduced blood supply coming to the child, that blood is direct, redirected to the brain of the baby so as to preserve the function of the brain. So the brain grows normally while the rest of the body tends to grow uh, less. That's why the weight is less and the, uh, the head, head circumference remains normal. Okay, so the no com common causes are uteroplacental insufficiency, chronic hypertension disease, preeclampsia, hemoglobinopathies, altitude, placental infarcts, and chronic abruption. abruption. These styles could sometimes could be symmetric or asymmetric, and this is called a combined type. And this is seen in 12% of small gestational age infants. Again, the causes are smoking, drugs, placental infarcts, chronic abru abruption, velamentous sensation, circumvalid placenta and multiple gestation. So larger gestational age babies, we see it in diabetic mothers, okay, commonly seen in diabetic mothers where the child has macrosomia, we call it macrosomia. It's also seen in a, a congenital condition known as Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, characterized by macroglossia, visceromegaly, macrosomia, umbilical hernia or omphalocele, umbilical hernia or omphalocele and neonatal hypoglycemia. Another condition where child uh, tends to be uh, larger gestation age is a condition known as high drops fetalis and maternal obesity will also be another uh, cause of larger gestation age babies. So now we have the Abgar score. Okay. So this Abgar score is to determine the child's condition immediately as the child is born. That's the whole purpose of using the Abgar score. So we uh, determine it uh, to determine the Abgar score. We assess four different, five different criteria. Okay. So first is we'll be looking at the heart rate, then the respiratory effort, muscle tone, reflex irritability, and the color of the baby. We have scores from 0, 1 and 2. So if, for example, we take the heart rate, the, uh, uh, the score of 0 is given when the child has an absent heart rate. If the score of 1 is given, it means the heart rate is slow. It is not normal. It is less than 100 beats per minute. A normal child's heart rate should be more than 100 beats per minute. And if the score is 2, which means it's normal, it, the heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute. Similarly, for respiratory effort, a score of 0 indicates absent or irregular breathing. A score of 1 indicates a slow crying uh, uh, pattern of breathing. And good suggests, uh, that is a score of 2, is good normal breathing. The muscle tone uh, a score of 0 means a limp muscle tone. A uh, score of 1 means some flexion of extremities, but it's actually not that normal. And the score of 2 will be active motion. The child is actively flexing and moving. Then we check the reflex irritability when you do the nose suction if the child makes a face. And if it's 0, that means the child does, has no response to uh, the irritability when we put the nose suction in. If the child makes a uh, face that's like a grimace type face, that's a score of 1. If the child coughs or sneezes, that's a, that's a good score. Where it's normal, that's 2. Then color. The color if the child is blue or pale or looking cyanosed, that means the score is 0. If the child is, determines a condition known as acrocyanosis, which is uh, uh, partially blue, not fully blue, that is uh, that is seen in the hands, where exactly blue, the bluishness is seen in your hands, then that is a score of 1. And uh, score of 2 will be completely pink, which is normal. Okay?
So how do we use this score now? We have scored the, the child. How do we use this score to determine the condition of the child? So if a score of more than 7, it indicates that the baby's condition is good. If the child has a score of 7. If the child has a score, score of uh, less than 4, it means that the child needs resuscitation. If it's uh, whatever happens, even if we continue resuscitating this child, this child needs to be, uh, this this uh, APCA score needs to be uh, assessed every 5 minutes until the child score reaches more than 7. It is a good score where it helps us to predict how long this child, uh, uh, how, if this child can survive getting born out or not. However, it's not that good in letting us know if this child can survive long term or not. It is just immediate survival score. So we come to examination of newborn. So we have the child is born. We immediately did the APCA score. The score is more than seven. So now good. let's assess everything else. So what are the things that we are going to do? When do we do this? We do it. We complete the physical examination within 24 hours after birth. So what are the components of the examination of a newborn? Firstly, will be vital signs. Second will be a complete head-to-toe -to -toe physical examination. Third will be a neurological exam. And fourth will be an estimation of gestational age. So first, vital signs. So what are the vital signs that we are going to be looking at? We'll be looking at temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and capillary refilling time. How do we measure this? Temperature should be taken axillary. The normal temperature for a child infant is 36.5 to 37.5 centigrade. The axillary temperature is 0 0.5 to 1 centigrade lower than the rectal temperature. Heart rate. The heart rate should be obtained by auscultation and counted for a full minute. Normal heart rate is 120 to 160 beats per minute. If the infant is tachycardic, the heart rate will be more than 170 beats per minute. Make sure the infant is not crying or moving vigorously. Respiratory rate. So a normal respiratory rate is 40 to 60 beats per minute. The respiratory rate should be obtained by observation for one full minute. Newborns have periodic rather than regular breathing. They breathe in periods. They uh, breathe uh, breathe properly for one period, then have a small interval, and then again breathe. So it's not regular like us newborns tend to have. Please keep that in mind. Blood pressure, it is not measured routinely, and the normal blood pressure vary, will always vary with gestational and postnatal ages. Capillary refilling time, uh, normally it, it should be less than 3 seconds over the trunk, maybe as long as 4 seconds on extremities. Delayed capillary refilling time indicates poor perfusion. Okay, when the child has poor perfusion to the peripheries, the capillary refilling time might be re uh, increased. Physical examination. Now, this is the phys complete head to toe physical examination. So, the first examination should be done either in the delivery room or as soon as possible after delivery. Second and a more detailed examination after 24 hours of life and then another examination should be done with 24 hours of this within 24 hours of discharge from hospital. So before we the first step of the physical examination will be measurements. We need to measure this child. So there are three main components where which indicates the growth measurements, which are weight, length, and head circumference. All of this should be plotted on a standardized growth curve for the infant's gestational age. As you can see, these are the growth curves. So the pink area suggests that the child is small for gestational age. The yellow is appropriate for gestational age or average gestational age. The blue area suggests the large for gestational age. So if the child corresponds with the... Uh, if the child's weight corresponds with the age of the child, then uh, and we just plot it according to that, okay? Right. So, 
weight. So weight of a full term infant at birth is normally between 2.6 to 3.8 kilograms. Babies less than 2.5 kilograms are considered low birth weight. Normally, a baby tends to lose 5 to 10 percent of his birth weight within the first few days and then slowly starts to regain their birth weight for, um, by 7 to 10 days. So the weight gain normally varies by around 15 to 20 grams per day. The length. So the length should be method, measured, measured from crown to heel length and it should be obtained on admission and weekly. Acceptable newborn length ranges from 48 to 52 centimeters at birth. So the, it is measured this way, we keep the child on a, uh, sometimes it's a small uh, bucket or some, something like that and then we measure the width, from, measure from the crown which is the head to the heel. Head circumference. Head circumference is, uh, should be measured on admission and weekly. Usually in the measuring paper tape, so it's just a measuring tape, normal measuring tape around the most prominent part of the occipital bone which is from the back to the front. So the, it should be measured from the most prominent parts from the forehead to the back of the head. Normal like, uh, head circumference at birth is uh, 33 to 38 centimeters. This is how you measure it. Then after we are done with the measurements, we go for a general examination. Here what we are trying to do is we are trying to observe the general appearance of this child. How does this child look when I look at him with my eyes? Before I go into detail, if I take a step back and look at the child, how does the child look? So we can easily check the color of the child. So the different colors that the child could have is normally the child should be pink, a very good pinkish in color. So uh, if the child is looking very pale and the pinkness is not that present, this child might be anemic. If the child has bluish tinges, especially around the mouth and the peripheries, this child could be having cyanosis. If the child is having too much redness, the child looks too red, it's not pink, it's reddish. That suggests a condition called plethora, which is seen in, in the condition known as polycythemia. And if the child is yellow, child can look yellowish in appearance which suggests jaundice which can be due to uh, neonatal jaundice where the serum bilirubin level has increased. As you can see in this baby especially around the mouth areas it's bluish in color. Acrocyanosis means the uh, fingers and toes so acro means fingers and toes so cyanosis so it's another term used for peripheral cyanosis. As you can see, John, this baby is a yellowish in color. Then we look at the skin. So what are we looking at the skin? We are looking at looking for any rashes. Are we seeing any rashes, any abnormalities visible in the skin? So normally, abnormalities we can see are purple rachymosis. Then we call it mottling, which is seen in preterm babies. Vernix caseosa is a coating, which is completely normal. Edema is all edema. Mongolian spots and colloidal infant. So vernix caseosa is that whitish material that is found when the child is born. It is a lubricant found on the skin and skin fold and it disappears as, as the fetus grows. And it's almost absent. If by, by the time the child comes until post term, it's almost absent. Purpura are little uh, patches of blood. Okay, very, very superficial patches of blood. Mottling means that when the child is either severely dehydrated or having poor perfusion to the skin. This is not normal and it is seen in preterm babies. Edema uh, of the foot. So if the foot is swollen, there can be edema common, sometimes seen in Turner syndrome. Mongolian spots are these blue, uh, bluish uh, patches on the back of the baby. They appear like bruises at the back of the baby. And in, it is seen in 90% of blacks and Asians, and it disappears by the age of four years. This is the appearance of a colloidal baby, which is abnormal, toxic-looking baby. Then there are 
look look at the skin we look for rashes so what are the common rashes milia which is a uh, benign condition which it just disappears after a few times erythema toxicum again disappears after a while and then we have the infectious uh, rash of bullous impetigo and diaper rash so milia what do we mean by milia they are white papules seen at the uh, nose and forehead and the cheeks there are sebaceous retention cysts which disappears within weeks. It are normally less than one millimeter in size. Erythema toxicum are white vesicles with a red base. So they are they have they are vesicular, which means they have fluid and they have uh, a red base seen. It contains eosinophils and it's normally seen after forty eight hours after birth. It is completely benign. Nothing to worry about. Bullous impetigo is a bacterial infection and it is uh, seen around the skin of the genitalia and the umbilicus and the abdomen. Then the candida diaper dermatitis which is seen when the child is having diapers and this could be a reaction to the diapers or an infection in that area and it is characterized by the redness of the area covered by the diaper. Port wine stains such as nevus flamus which is the example here. This is a uh, seen in children who have a condition known as uh, uh, neurocutaneous syndromes, where there is something wrong, uh, there is a condition that is wrong in the brain, as well as it has manifestations that are visible from the skin. Head and neck. So after we, so we had our measurement, then we looked at the uh, general appearance of the child, the color of the child, then we looked at the skin how the skin appears and then we look for any rashes. Now we are going to straight away go into head and neck. Head to toe examination begins with the head. So the skull, what we are going to be looking at is the any deformities in the skull. So the common deformities is we could have this ab abnormal size of the skull, which if it's big, it's called microcephaly and if it's small, we call it microcephaly. Then any condition such as caput succinatum, uh, cephalhematoma, subgallial hemorrhage and we look at the fontanel so we examine the head of the child so hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus is seen when there is a increased amount of fluid collection in the head in the cranium this is normally due to a congenital defect where the csf fluid uh, cannot drain properly so when this doesn't drain properly it gets collected within the skull when this happens, the head enlarges. Okay, that is hydrocephaly. This is also a common cause for macrocephaly, which is large skull. Okay, microcephaly is uh, seen here. It's again a congenital disease. Sometimes, uh, more recently, it was the uh, problem that came when pregnant mothers were infected with the Zika virus. Then caput succinatum is due to an edema of the skin of the scalp. This is due to sometimes when the baby is being uh, delivered due to maternal birth trauma. Due to the maternal birth, the, during birth, due to trauma during birth, the child can tend to have an edema or fluid collection underneath the skin of the scalp which makes the head appear like this. Cephal hematoma is a uh, subperiosteal hemorrhage. It is it is a uh, hemorrhage at the underneath the periosteum, which causes a swelling. Okay, all right, and uh, it can have a little bit of complications. It can cause an underlying linear skull fracture, jaundice, calcification, infection, and intracranial hemorrhage. Okay, and subgallial hemorrhage is again another type of hemorrhage which is seen under the aponeurosis of the scalp. Okay, then we have this is the most common one. Those are the we we look at we look at the skull to see any if those deformities are there. Then we tend we look at the fontanelle. We have anterior and posterior fontanelles, and fontanelles are just gaps in the skull where the bo where where there is room for this. Uh, skull to grow and then later they fuse later on in time. So we have one, the commonest one is the anterior fontanelle. Here if we look at the size of the anterior fontanelle first. So in a newborn baby we don't expect it to be closed. So we'll be looking at the see if it's present and we look at the size of the 
anterior fontanelle if the anterior fontanelle is larger than normal then we suspect conditions such as hypothyroidism osteogenesis imperfecta and hydrocephalus if the anterior fontanelle is small then we look at conditions such as microcephaly or craniostenosis now after we are done looking at the size of the anterior fontanelle we need to look at the condition of the anterior fontanelle now this anterior fontanelle can be two things it could either be bulging out or it could be depressed if it's bulging bulging out it suggests a condition where the child's intracranial pressure has increased so what are the conditions that increases the intracranial pressure conditions like meningitis and inflammation of the meninges hydrocephalus where there is fluid collection leading to an increase intracranial pressure and any intracranial hemorrhage a depressed anterior fontanelle is the other way around where there is reduced csf fluid which can be seen in conditions like dehydration therefore this anterior fontanelle can be depressed the posterior fontanelle at the back is a, is a rare, uh, it's rarer than the anterior fontanelle to be affected and if it's large normal larger than normal you have to suspect hypothyroidism now we are done with the head <coughs> we finished the skull then we finish the fontanelle now we are going to move down along the head into our eyes so we'll be examining the eyes so what are we going to be looking at the eyes so we need to check the pupils are they first reactive <coughs> so we check if the pupils are reactive then are the size of the pupils the same is there a pupillary reaction or is the reaction equal all right so after we are done with the pupil we'll be looking at the cornea to see if there is any deformities of the cornea is there any deformity of the conjunctiva any abnormality of the conjunctiva or the iris are they equal then we'll be looking at any muscle paralysis where the child might be having a squint is there any abnormality where the child's eyeballs are, are having a squint so sometimes the children may have subconjunctival hemorrhage which is a benign condition and resolves up by two to four weeks if the child mother had a maternal uh, rubella infection while the child was in the stomach then the child could have a congenital cataract then the child could also have glaucoma where the intra intraocular pressure is increased and this transverted eye, eye movements may be seen in uh, squints now we go for ear examination now what are we going to look at in the ear so we wear the eyes, now we wear the ears. What are we going to look at in the ears? So we have to look at the size and the shape of the ear, obviously. And see, see if they match. If the ears match, if the right and left ears look the same. Then we will look for any presence of auricular or preauricular pits, fleshy appendages, lipomas or skin tags. Another thing that we have to look at is something called low set ears. Here we draw an imaginary line from the lateral canthus of the eyes to the ears. So a low set ear baby will have will have the ears uh, below the uh, imaginary line. Okay, and this normally suggests uh, any gen genito urinary abnormalities. If the child has any malformed ears, then it can be associated with Down syndrome or Turner syndrome. This is an example of the ear tag, which you see. Then we have to look at the nose. What are we going to look at the nose? We'll be mainly looking at uh, the patency of the nostrils, in like a condition called cloanal atresia. Sometimes we look at flaring of the nostrils, which can be seen in respiratory distress syndromes. Sometimes this nasal septum can be dislocated. It is supposed to be in the middle of the nose. It can get dislocated to one side and cause a complete obstruction. Now we go to mouth. So when we are looking in the mouth, we start from the lips. Then we go in. We check the palate. Then we check the tongue. And then we check the teeth. So we have the cleft lip. So common candidates that we have to look out for are cleft lip and cleft palate. So this cleft lip is what happens is when our body grows, it grows from it grows and meets up and it goes the two sides grow together and meet in the center. Sometimes when they meet at the center, especially from the mouth and the palate, one side may not come fully to the center, leaving a gap. 
and it doesn't fuse properly in the middle in the midline. So this is called if it happens in the lip, it's called cleft lip. If it happens to the palate, it's called cleft palate. This can be unilateral where it's one side, or it can be both sides haven't come come and met at the middle. That's called bilateral. So unilateral cleft lip and cleft palate appears like this. This is cleft lip, and bilateral cleft lip and cleft palate appears like this. So what's the problem? The problem happens when the food but particles tend to go to the nasopharynx and cause problems. Yeah. Okay. Right. Then these children sometimes might have condition called Epstein pearls or cheeks, where you see white cysts which contain keratin being deposited on the palate. And it results in one to two months. Sometimes a child could have something called a ranula. A ranula is a small bluish white swelling of the on the floor of the mouth. Here it's just a cyst, it's a collection of fluid from the mucous glands, okay? And that's just a collection of fluid. Again, benign, but it has to be removed. Sometimes, now we we'll go to the tongue. When we go to the tongue, we have to be looking at the size, shape of the tongue, if there is any muscle wasting of the tongue, and we have to lift the tongue up and see if the frenulum is normal. So, normal tongue, the frenulum will be normal, and it will allow normal mobility of the tongue. Sometimes, these children can have a condition called ankyloglossia, which means the tongue the the frenulum of the tongue is shorter so the tongue will not be allowed to move like a, as normal because it's shorter and it's holding the tongue down as you can see some children may have natal teeth where the, uh, as soon as they're born they could have a teeth popping up conditions like congenital hypothyroidism children could have a condition called macroglossia where the tongue is abnormally large and children could also have, uh, newborn babies could also have infections, candida infections of the mouth, which appears like white patches, called oral thrush. Now, we have done the head, let's move to the neck. So in the neck, we what can we have? Commonly, we can have swellings in the neck. So it, it could either be cysts or masses. Cysts are normally thyroglossal cysts, where uh, the, the thyroglossal duct has an, which was developing has some form, the fluid gets collected there and there will be a midline uh, cyst in the middle of the neck or cystic hygroma, again a collection of fluid. Then ma uh, masses such as a sternocleidomastoid tumour and thyroid tumours. So, and the neck, if you look from the back, in certain conditions like turners, you could have webbed necks. So this is a sternocleidomastoid of the tumour, which can cause limitation of the lateral rotation of the neck. And this is what a webbed neck appears like. Now that we have completed our head, to head and neck examination, we will go to the musculoskeletal examination. So what are we going to look at in the musculoskeletal area? We'll be looking at fractures, dislocations, number of fingers if it's polydactyly or syndactyly more or less and any other deformities so herbs paralysis is a common paralysis seen in a condition called shoulder dystocia where the child's arm is abducted uh, adducted uh, internally rotated and extended okay so this is seen in shoulder dystocia where the child's shoulder anterior shoulder gets stuck while delivering and when it gets stuck, it gets compressed and your brachial plexus gets affected. Then we have polydactyly where the child could have more than five fingers or five toes. Syndactyly is when the child appears to have less than five toes or fingers. This is actually, it could only be due to soft tissue attachment only, which is in simplex. Simple, where just the soft tissue is attached. In complex, it will be... It will involve fusion of bone and nail, partial where the web extends from the base partially and complete where the web from base to the tip of finger. Radiographs need radiographs are needed to determine the degree of fusion and this child should always be checked, uh, have, have, have an x-ray done and should always be referred to orthopedic doctors. Then talipers equinovarus is another common condition, it's not common but it's a condition seen where uh, the child's forefoot is inverted and adducted 
heel is also inverted uh, there is lim limited dorsiflexion and the leg is internally rotated there is no proper cause for this it just tends to happen and sometimes there can be secondary causes which is very rare once we are done so we have to look at the hands we look at the hands for all these deformities any fractures or anything like that and then we have to look at the f uh, legs as well and then we go to the hip joint and there is uh, sorry we turn the child over and look at the back for some a condition known as meningocele or myelomeningocele what that is is or another term for this is also called spina bifida due to a prop improper fusion the spinal cord tends to bulge out from the vertebral column and this happens normally at the back and it is prone for compression damage and also uh, and also infection and these children can have neurological deficits as a result so the child has to ha have it operated on then we need to check for uh, hip dislocation sometimes congenitally these children are more prone to having their hips dislocated so we have two tests that we have. so this is a picture of a meningomyelocele and meningocele so a meningomyelocele has a has the meninges of the spinal cord together with the neural bundle of the spinal cord where meningocele just the meninges pop out which is completely fine so then we have the developmental dysplasia of hips where the hips get dislocated so uh, there are two tests that we do to see if these children have normal or not which is the Barlow's test and the Ortolanis maneuver to see if the child's hips get dislocated or not once we have completed the musculoskeletal examination, we will go for uh, systemic examination such as chest and uh, lung, lung chest examinations where we have the lung examination and the heart examination. So what do we check in the chest and lung examination? First we have to check for inspection. What are we going to look at? We look at the breasts. If the, uh, if the breast bloods are abnormally enlarged and uh, or not if the nipple is in normal size if the nipples sp are spaced properly or not sometimes the uh, nipples can be spaced widely in conditions like turner's and noonan's syndrome then we look for the shape of the chest it, is it pectus excavatum or pectus carinatum pectus carinatum is a narrow thorax with a wide anterior posterior angle pectus excavatum is like a big uh, it's it's enlarged fr front and back and it's wide and there's a gap in the middle the sternum has gone back so when the sternum goes back there is, it looks like it's excavated the middle of the sternum looks excavated so the chest looks like the middle of it has been excavated then we go for uh, we, we go to observe the breathing pattern so we had to look if the child is having normal breathing and uh, normally they have a small period of apnea where the child is not breathing and then breathe again this is called periodic breathing okay we have to observe the respiratory rate we have to observe the chest movement if it's if they are moving symmetrical and then we have to look for if there are any chest wall retractions where there is where there are little uh, retractions of the chest wall then we need to look at uh, we need to auscultate, keep a stethoscope and look at for any added sounds like strider, grunting, uh, wheezes and crackles. This is a slight substernal retraction during inspiration. Once we are done with the uh, lungs, we go to the heart. So what are, what are we going to look at the heart? So first we will see if the child has any cyanosis suggesting a congenital heart disease where it's cyanotic in nature. So uh, if the child is showing cyanosis, any test is indicated called hyperoxia test where we check the partial oxygen, uh, partial pressure of oxygen in an ABG while the child is breathing oxygen in uh, uh, artificial oxygen or the child is breathing and, and when the child is breathing naturally and we see the difference of that. That is called the hyperoxia test. Check the heart rate if it's the child is tachycardic or bradycardic if the heart rate is low or high then look at the precordial area where the heart area which is on the left side and see if there's any increased activity where the where you can see the uh, pounding of the heart 
muscles which are abnormally then uh, after that we have to auscultate the heart sounds to see if there are any irregular rhythms or mainly murmurs murmurs indicate congenital heart defects okay right and then we check for percussion which is a condition which is to see the percussion of the this uh, with capillary refilling time we have to also look for uh, femoral pulsations and also look at uh, uh, radio radial delay or radio femoral delays if there is a radio femoral delays it is due to coarctation of iota okay right once we are done with the heart we will move to the abdomen in the abdomen what are we going to look at we are going to look at the appearance of the abdomen first how does the abdomen look what is the size of the abdomen is it distended what is the shape of that normally it's supposed to be a scaphoid shape but if it's protruding out then you look at the see if there are any dilated veins after that we look at but the most important thing to look at in the abdomen is going to be your umbilicus here we are going to look at the umbilical stump we are going to be looking at if it's ble if there's any bleeding if there's any meconium staining if there are any granulomas discharge or any inflammation then sometimes from this umbilicus they can be uh, intestines protruding out from the umbilicus herniating out from the umbilicus which is called omphalocele and gastroschisis all right after we look at the uh, abdomen we will go to palpate it to see if the child has any organomegaly if the liver is palpable or the spleen is palpable then we can auscultate for bowel sounds as well. This is how the abdomen normally looks like. It normally looks cylindrical in shape. The normal umbilicus will be bluish white with two arteries and one vein. This is the appearance of a meconium stained umbilicus. And this is a omphalocele seal where the intestine or the abdominal organs tend to herniate through the umbilicus. Once we are done with the abdomen, we will move on to the genitalia. So, when you go to a male genitalia, we have to look at in full term, the scrotum will be well developed with deep rugae, the appearance of rugae on the skin of the scrotum. And both testes will be in the scrotum. So, we need to palpate and see if we can feel both testes. If the if one testis has not descended, we call it cryptorganism or maldescended testis. In a preterm baby, scrotum will be very small and with very few rugae and the testes are ab absent or high in the scrotum. So the common abnormal disease will be undescended the testes. They can be congenital hydrocele's where uh, this is due to a congenital defect and the child could have a hydrocele, inguinal hernia or hypospadias. So this is a bilateral hydrocele seen in the children bilateral inguinal hernia where the abdominal organs protrude into the scrotum again due to a congenital defect. Hypospadias is when the urethra opens at the bottom of the penis instead of from the tip. That is called hypospadias. In a female genitalia, in full term, the labia majora should completely cover the labia minora. In preterm, the labia majora is widely separated and labia minora is protruded. A discharge from the vagina or any withdrawal bleeding may be observed in the first few days. Infants from ambiguous with ambiguous gender should not undergo gender assignment until endocrine evaluation is performed. So what is amb ambiguous genitalia is when there is an abnormal balance of uh, steroid hormones such as your estrogen and testosterone where the uh, labia major and minora tend to get hyperplasia where they get thicker. When they get thicker, they appear like two scrotum. They appear like two scrotum. Okay, they appear like a scrotum. So we, it is very ambiguous. We can't determine the gender. It could either be the child could be having a multiple uh, transgender child, or it could also be a uh, ambiguous genitalia, which is due to congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Therefore, we need to do an endocrine evaluation before we assign gender. As you can see, it appears like a. This is an ambiguous gender. This is a female child look appearing to have a male genitalia, seen in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Okay. 
After the genitalia, we turn to look at the anus. And one of the most common conditions we can see is called an imperforated anus, where the anal opening is completely fused. Due to this, the child will not have uh, uh, the child will not have uh, normal passage of meconium or feces. He'll have delayed passage of that. And sometimes the children tend to have sinuses forming on other sides where the fecal matter will come out from a different spot due to a sinus being formed. So normally their patency is often checked by careful insertion of a rectal thermometer to see if the rectum is patent or not to check the baby's temperature. So meconium should pass in the first 48 hours to birth. So if it's not passed then it suggests an intestinal obstruction which could be either due to imperforatedness or any intestinal in obstruction. Urine should be passed within the first 24 hours of life. So now that completes our head to toe. What did we have in the head to toe examination? First we measured the vital signs, then we measured the child's, uh, uh, child's uh, height, weight and uh, head circumference. After that we went to the child's skin, the color of the child, the uh, appearance of the skin and then any rashes that were visible. Following that we went to a, a head to toe examination where we checked the uh, skull of the child. Then we checked the, uh, any, 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 the anterior fontanelles of the child. Then after that we, we went to the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, lips and neck. Then we had a full musculoskeletal examination. Then lungs, la we examined the chest and lungs. Then we examined the heart, abdomen, genitalia genitalia and the anus. Now we have to go do a neurological examination to see if the child is neurologically mature. So what are we going to look at? We'll be looking at the muscle tone to see if the child has any convulsions while waiting or any neo check the delay of any neonatal reflexes. Commonly what are we going to look at? It will be the posture of the child. Term infants normally have a posture of hips abducted and partially flexed with knees flexed. The arms will be abducted and flexed at the elbow. The fists are often clenched with the fingers covering the thumb. So this flexed posture is a very good indicator of the child being mature and healthy. The tone we, uh, we do, we have to support the infant in one hand under the chest and neck extensors should be able to hold the head in line for 3 seconds. So the, the baby's neck should be able to hold the, uh, sorry, baby's uh, neck muscle should be able to hold the head in one place. It is normally done to, uh, it is normally done uh, to test the tone. So if the child is having a poor tone, this neck will be very floppy. Okay, and it will show, uh, it should not be having a head lag of more than 10%. This is what a hypotonia baby looks like. An increased tone which can be seen in conditions like opistotonus which is seen in E. coli meningitis. Then the best way to check the health of a child is to do the neonatal reflexes. These are also called primitive reflexes. You are born with these reflexes and it is an indicator of good neurological function. Okay. They consist of autonomic behaviors that do not require a higher level of brain function. You don't need to train that. They are automatically there. And they can provide in information about the integrity of the CNS and the absence indicates CNS depression. They are often protective and disappear as higher level motor functions emerges. So, commonest and the most important reflex will be the Moro's reflex. It happens after the child has developed over 28 to 32 weeks of gestation. It disappears within 4 to 6 months of life and it is the most important reflex in neonatal period. So how do we do it? We have to hold the baby in supine position. You have one hand behind the baby controlling him and then you have another hand where you elevate the head slowly up while holding this child in supine position. And suddenly you let go and the head falls down. As soon as the child's head goes down, the child has a 
response, a natural response. And what is this response? It is the extension of his back, extension and abduction of his upper limbs, and flexion and adduction of the lower limbs. He flexes his legs, extend his hands, and then sometimes the child will also cry. These are all indicators of, a, of the uh, morose reflex being present. If there is an absence, the child could be having CNS depression by narcotics or anesthesia, brain anoxia where the oxygen supply is not good, chronic terrace where there is too much bilirubin getting deposited in the brain, and a very premature baby. If there are asymmetric responses, this could be due to unilateral conditions such as herbs palsy, fracture of clavicle or humerus. If the uh, morose reflex is still there more than six months and doesn't disappear, this could indicate a CNS damage. Then we have common other reflexes which can be tested, such as the suckling reflex. So when a finger or a nipple is placed in the mouth, the child will continue, will suck on it. So we put a so small finger or a nipple, the child will start to suck on it. And that is that appears at 32 weeks of gestation and disappears by three to four months. There you go. This is what something reflex looks like. Then we have the rooting reflex. Here, this is well established after 32 to 34 weeks of gestation and disappears to three to four months. Here, where if we stroke the corner of the upper lip, the child's head will turn towards the similars and open its mouth. Okay, if we push stroke from the side, the child's will slowly turn his head and open his mouth towards the stimulus. There you go. Then we have palmer graft, which is established after 36 weeks of gestation and disappears after 4 months. It is elicited by the examiner placing her finger on the palmer surface of the infant's hand and the infant grasps the finger. So if you put a small finger at the infant, the infant will grasp it. And if you try to remove your finger, the child will tighten its grip and will not try to let go. So this is how you assess palmer graphs to see if it's present. Okay, there you go. This is how you do it. And if it's absent, then it's such a CNS depression. If it's if it persists for longer, it means the CNS is damaged. Then we have the stepping reflex. So, how do we do the stepping reflex? It is seen 35 to 36 weeks of gestation and disappears at 6 weeks. It is elicited by touching the top of the infant foot to the edge of a table. We keep the infant upright and keep the infant uh, down uh, here where the foot is touching, the, just touching the table. As soon as the foot touches, the infant's legs will make movements such as stepping or walking, taking steps. This is called the stepping reflex. There you go. So placing is when the dorsum of the baby's foot touches the table and uh, uh, touches the under surface of the table, the fle flexion then extension to place or put his foot on the table will happen. So if you put one foot at the uh, underneath the table, the other foot will be kept on top of the table. It's called placing this, as you can see. Then, how do we estimate the gestational age of the baby? So, obstetricians normally tend to go for last menstrual period or ultrasound. However, we have another score which is called the pallet score. This is done after within 12 to 24 hours of life and it is uh, to check the neuromuscular maturity and the physical maturity. So the score will uh, have six marks for neuromuscular and six marks for physical maturity. So they will be looking the sick, they'll be looking at the uh, uh, external categories such as edema, skin texture, color, opacity, lanugo, plant creases, nipples and breast, ear form and firmness and genitals. The neuromuscular score will consist of posture, square window, arm recoil, popliteal angle, scarf sign and heel to ear. This is what they'll be looking at. Okay. And uh, based on the score, we will determine how mature the child is. 
and how much the gestational age of the child is at birth. That concludes our lecture on neonatal assessment. I hope you learned, uh, uh, you, le you had a good lesson. Uh, it is very important to know how to do the uh, how to do the newborn examination as it is important to assess the well-being of the child. And uh, ho I hope that after this lecture, all, all of you will become good nurses with, with proper skill and understanding on how to perform a neonatal assessment. Thank you.